So I, I repeat again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the first speaker of our plenary session is Professor Frantisek Czermak. Uh, the topic is phraseology and idiomatics, substance and vagaries of use. Very good morning to all of you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. In past, idioms and phrases have always been used by people even in the oldest attested records, such as Latin ferum recipere, uh, to indicate that the wounded gladiator would, should be finished off by the victor. Or a proverb from Egyptian temples, there grows no wheat where there is no grain, uh, which sounds oddly modern even today. Idioms have always been used much the same way as nowadays. Even though there were no linguists around at the time, uh, worrying what sort of phenomenon this is and why it exists. Why it is so popular being constantly in use, primarily the spoken one. If nothing else, uh, these two examples might show a quite natural, obvious, and in fact extremely useful quanti qualities for retaining and using idioms despite the rumblings of latter-day theoreticians complaining that idioms do not fit their nice schemata and petty theories. Uh, however, these theoretical and largely unsuccessful activities do some, uh, of some theoretical linguists are a relatively new phenomenon in linguistics. Uh, and one must just wonder why, since for centuries no prior theory of idioms has ever been proclaimed while idioms had just been used to no astonishment of its users, just like many other things. It is difficult to stop wondering up to what extent uh, this might be due to modern linguists having forgotten the impact of the ancient Greek tradition of analogy and anomaly opposition, applying basically to everything in, the, in function as well as in the development of language. In the following, I will try to point to factors emanating directly from this ancient distinction and to some of the consequences following from this, in an attempt to base as much as possible on corpus data, basically within a structuralist framework. Five years ago, an attempt at a representative survey of use on phraseology and idiomatics has been published thanks to a number of authors led by Professor Burger trying to map the whole field into many thematic uh, sections. Um, however, despite the obvious and general consensus as to what is and what was actually included there, there is no section oriented towards the spoken language there, which I will try to deal uh, a little bit more here and which I consider a serious mistake. The point raised here is simple and basic. Since all languages, being technically first spoken, have developed their own idioms there in this medium, in the spoken medium, these idioms do not always behave the same way in the spoken text as those in the written text which, to which most, if not exclusive, attention is still being paid to. Uh, perhaps the Slowly growing number of authentic spoken corpora may eventually shed some light onto this, though sufficient spoken contexts that are necessary here are almost non-existent so far. Generally, the rise and existence of idioms uh, must be, first of all, attributed to the need for language economy, as idioms are basically always shorter and more to the point as far as needs of language nomination is concerned, leaving aside other less pertinent reasons. There seems to be an intricate interplay between analogy and anomaly, specifically between regularity of distribution and entropy, whose mutual influences and clashes are far from being recognized and fully understood. One of the starting dictums for the following notes will be that idioms are both products of anomaly and part of the resulting language entropy, being at the same time highly economic means of expression. 
Every language, even though it may not have its written form yet, does have some idioms in a broad sense, such as Akan, a West African Kwa language in Ghana, or in Arisami in the scarcely populated northern Scandinavia. Uh, to give you an example, Kumpi Yurat Pokuit, the wolf makes reindeers turn around, that is feeling the threat. This point implies what has been pointed to by many people over and over again. There has not been found a language without idioms, hence existence of idioms may be taken for granted everywhere and seen as a language universal. Yet on the other hand, due to different cultures lying behind them, languages never seem to have exactly the same idioms, even the closely related ones. The number of problems amassed in the analysis and perception of idioms is growing almost exponentially. Basically, with any major new attempt at a solution of these, often supported by brand new theory. This is basically due to repeated and unsuccessful attempts to apply standard analytical and theory based or theory bound criteria to data that are not standard and do not fit any theory. However, many of the attempts persist, often under different and overlapping names, due to a particular fashionable and, let's say, cure-all theory applied. Most of these views do have one thing in common. Uh, they may look nice on paper, not having actually been put to the hardest test of all. Um, that is, an exhaustive working description of all data in a single language, that is, in a dictionary primarily. It is difficult to find so many interpretations of hot problems uh, pestering the view of idioms and phrases that are squeezed comfortably into a single statement. In a volume on idioms, something like 20 years ago by Everard, however, Gregor Erbach, a German author, offers an epitome of such a case as he formulates, just like many before and after him, a seemingly innocuous and plausible statement. Quote, lexicalized metaphorical expressions or analyzable idioms like pull strings differ from idioms proper in that the meaning of the expression can be modified by modifying the, its constituent parts, that is, pull certain strings. Unquote. I will briefly dwell on this. My brief comments on the congestion of problems offered here follows, uh, and I will try uh, to touch on form, meaning, function, and some other things. Any such statement uh, has a background made up of a number of prerequisites and presuppositions, either sufficiently explained or taken for granted. In this case, five basic aspects of form that should have been made clear at the very onset include idioms identity or stableness, variability, composite character, and possibly derivation too. First of all, let us have a look at the general terminology used here. Saying that pull strings is a metaphorical expression which amounts to an analyzable idiom begs for an explanation. Does this mean that all lexicalized metaphors are analyzable metaphors? or only some of them. Does this sweeping statement include also non-lexicalized metaphors, which are analyzable too? Or vice versa, does Erbach mean that there are some analyzable idioms that are not metaphoric by their nature? Obviously, his statement above is open to more than one interpretation. Another problem uh, representing the term uh, expression used primarily for a parole usually identical with idiom here uh, is uh, a problem because uh, expression is always part of la parole. Or does he implicitly actually deny the long parole distinction by using this term? We do not know. The author does not deal with the identity or identification of idioms. He just chooses randomly uh, a single example as an illustration of his thesis, which is the case with very many authors, having just one example and a nice theory built on it. 
However, admitting analyzability by the insertion of certain strings, as he suggests, the very idea of the idiom's stability becomes undermined. Neither does he comment on variability, uh, such as pull the strings, pull some strings, or variation, uh, such as his pulling the strings. Hence, in his simplified example, to what does he actually relate his views? Why is the idiom mentioned in Erbach's view labeled as analyzable? To be able to do this, one has to make sure that it is clear what one is actually talking about the very entity and identity of the idiom. Though its variability pointed to a moment ago weakens any idea of the idiom's indisputable identity and solid form. This is where the first objection must be raised. It may, be, it may seem that there is no stability of the idiom as it does have several variants not dealt with in the author's firm attitude quoted above. In general, however, variants do not undermine the idiom's identity, provided their meaning and function are identical, but they have to be duly accounted for. To come to the crux of the matter, one must ask what is really meant by saying that the idiom is analyzable. Though the problem is usually relegated to semantics, which I will come to shortly, However, to stick uh, to the form here, analyzability also means formal possibility of the idiom's dissection that is breaking its form and separating at least some of the components, giving them a life of their own. Erbach doesn't go so far, identifying and limiting analyzability as a mere possibility to insert a word uh, by an operation which he calls modifiability. There is no mention, however, as to where and under what circumstances this seems possible to him. This is closely connected with the following point. Having chosen as his argument supporting modifiability of the idiom a presumably special capacity of the adjective certain to be inserted, Erbach is skating on a very thin ice indeed. There is no support for this kind of possibility indicated in the British National Corpus with its over 60 occurrences of the idiom to be found in its 100 million words. Moreover, none of these occurrences permits any other adjective. Uh, to modify this idiom uh, is uh, a problem. To move a little bit on to still larger data, to let's say Google data comprising uh, a year ago, over 8 billion uh, web pages, um, we do find that uh, uh, there is no record of this possibility either, which Erbach uh, suggests that it exists. This may not really mean very much, as there is always an individual creativity at play, uh, but it has to be supported by some analogy, which he has not found. Yet this is impossible to find anywhere, therefore, and Erbach's conviction and by the same token his argument becomes very much problematic. Hence we may just ask again, do we then believe large data or an intuition of a speaker, or if you like theoretician, let alone a non-native speaker? Despite many existing views on what metaphor is and where its limits are, one might raise a simple objection to Erbach's interpretation of pull strings as being metaphoric. For any metaphor to be successful that is viewed as such, it has to indicate more or less clearly uh, the basis from where it stems and with which it is somehow linked. In other words, a minimal context is needed such as and I quote from British National Corpus, Ace had spoken of his intention to try and pull things on her behalf, but she hadn't thought he'd have that much clout with a multinational the size of IMP, probably a company, which still may not be sufficient telling us or the user what exactly is meant and what should be achieved by the act of pulling the strings. In a way, one is back to the ground zero where 
one either knows the idiom from a previous usage, recognizes it as metaphorical, and is prepared to view it uh, in this new context as an extension of a metaphor, uh, or that he or she has learned before, or one does not understand it. This is a simple case of difference between a dictionary lemma uh, with its limited information. Uh, for this idiom, it is make use of one's influence and context to gain an advantage unofficially or unfairly in no D dictionary. Between a dictionary and text, the latter relying heavily on one's personal knowledge and experience, which may not be shared by all users. However, the type and extent of metaphoricity uh, may be uh, much different, more subtle. A primitive traditional view tends to identify it with a concrete image. The idiom pulled together may or may not be metaphorical, uh, depending on the interpretation. An easy way out here is to see two homonyms, homonymous combinations here. The real problem actually appears where there are no concrete nouns or verbs involved. That was pulled together and we can contrast it with take advantage or turn something to one's advantage and ask, are these metaphors too? Theoreticians so fond of metaphoricity in idiomatics carefully steer away from the point. Uh, so what is metaphorical and where does it start and where does it end? Um, isolated examples used in vigorous statements uh, such as this is metaphorical because I perceive it as such are just that, uh, isolated examples and nothing more. Phraseology would certainly be a very narrow field should one confine it to it, that is to metaphors only. The last example, take advantage based on non-concrete components or constituents, does indicate something labeled differently, though rarely conceived in its substance. Combinations such as add, be, exploit, have, gain, give, take, possess, turn to one's advantage, uh, to use what is given by the dictionaries, uh, show that real language use, <clears throat> if inspected closely, uh, has definite limits of collocability of the advantage, of the word advantage taking basically, and usually, surprise, surprise, only seven verbs combining with. More extreme cases of limited collocability, that is combinatorial capacity, attested by very large corpora, can be found in, uh, let's say, accordance, another example, the word existing uh, only thanks to its combination with two prepositions, only two prepositions, otherwise it doesn't exist, namely in accordance with. See also similar cases of abstracts such as abeyance, admittance, auspices, and so on, taking extremely small number of verbs. Uh, in all of these cases, it is probably impossible, uh, impossible to see any metaphor at all. I will come back to this in a moment. Since meaning of idioms uh, is a rather complex uh, matter, it might be a good starting point leading to many specific aspects, uh, if at least two central issues are addressed here, that of the image, whatever that is, or the metaphor, and that of semantic decomposability. Above, both have been briefly broached upon for something to be decomposable, However, one has to be sure first that there obtains semantic compositionality because only what is compositional can be analyzed. Based on a premise that the idiom's holistic meaning is a total sum of components' meanings. And this is, as we know, where many problems of interpretation arise. Metaphoricity seems to be far from being the unique and sole feature of the idiom's meaning. Only some idioms are metaphorical. Cases such as in accordance with do show that the metaphor, though probably one of the central aspects of idioms, there is no doubt about that, is not essential for the bulk of idioms. Most idioms are not metaphorical. 
in accordance with or take advantage of are frequent types and represent very large parts of the field indeed. Should we realize that basically most abstract nouns have this sort of severely limited collocability? Here, no metaphor is to be found, while these combinations do require a special attention too, which is due simply to collocation restriction or limited collocability, which boils down to a kind of combinatorial anomaly. In fact, all multivariate prepositions uh, Particles and most conjunctions do belong here too. The other aspect, that of decomposability or analyzability or non Phrygian compositionality, if you like, has also been partly implied above. Accepting that the, the idiom, both in its form and meaning, is a holistic phenomenon that is non compositional, a satisfactory view for many, though not still all. These people, such as Erbach, are many really hard trying generativists and other keep, actually do keep pointing to cases such as rain, cats, and dogs, being quite satisfied that rain actually stands out for the traditional rain here, therefore it is semantically identifiable and hence the idiom is decomposable. Two objections may readily be raised against this kind of simplistic approach. First, in the system, rain has more than one meaning, uh, and the argument here refers only to the major meaning. And second, having artificially isolated rain and taken it out, uh, that is stopping halfway in the proposed analysis, no such approach goes on giving any indication as to how to improve, interpret the rest, that is, uh, cats and dogs. Should we then uh, read cats and dogs paradoxically as very much? Cats and dogs amounting to very much. The absurdity of such a half-baked analysis becomes evident, as it is no analysis at all, actually. Just a partial impressionistic touch solving nothing. And an analysis must be based on a standard repeatable criteria supported by analogy, again, analogy in the background. This, however, is not the case. I wonder how many of such approaches should look, uh, because that would help them, uh, for a converse uh, inspiration in chemistry, where no such dissection is ever suggested, as chemists do really know better than linguists, realizing that any compound, for it to become a compound, must have undergone a chemical reaction. Uh, a case example is to be seen in, a, in and behind uh, a simple uh, thing such as sodium chloride, where no one actually dares, that is table salt, where no one dares to view, uh, which no one dares to view as simply analyzable into sodium, which is an element, chemical, and a chloride, a compound, since the reaction and the whole process requiring a number of conditions fulfilled is rarely reversed. Never, however, by a mere separation of this type that actually, unfortunately, linguists still are trying to do. Of course, there may be a misunderstanding in terms used here. Uh, since idioms are semantically not a sum uh, of meanings of the components, this does not mean that some components are not similar superficially to the words that they are built on or built from. However, this does not warrant the type of pseudo-analysis referred to above, though some kind of a laborious semi-subclassification is also um, possible, though problematic classifications in this way is an open thing and uh, one must just wonder how much data uh, it will cover. While both the formal and semantic identity can be upheld as no decomposability has really been proved on a regular and general scale, the whole field of phraseology and idiomatics does exhibit a number uh, uh, of meaning features that belong to certain formal types only and are not general. 
the term of grammar idioms is functional, referring to all idioms that exist parallel to one word grammar words having the same function, namely prepositions, conjunctions, particles, which are scarce in English, and uh, also pronouns and numerals. Uh, to give you some examples, at least in English, with respect to as to, as if, at one, one and all, and so on. Their meaning, should we choose to stick to the idea of meaning and not function, is special, not only in its not being composition, but in the anomaly of the combination of its components. Thus, there is no fixed expression such as as, at, as, on, as, behind, and so on, analogous the initial idiomatic as to. The same feature of anomalous and severely restricted combination has been raised above, uh, namely for abstract nouns combinations such as take advantage of, one of the major subfields of idioms. Looking at the core idioms in any language, it is obvious that the majority, mostly those based on metaphors made up specifically of probably universal body part components, that is, somatic idioms, uh, it is obvious that they are built on concrete noun components, such as take it into one's hand, head, hand in hand, leave no stone unturned, and so on. And this is uh, a very large part of the phraseology of any language. The impossibility to define uh, the idiom's meaning exactly brings us to the feature of vagueness of its meaning, such as in give, uh, lend a hand with something in the meaning of assist in an action or enterprise. However, the dictionary definition given begs again uh, for specifying what is actually left out, namely, can one give a hand in convincing someone devising a plan? putting child to sleep, or even killing someone. Though British National Corpus examples point to concrete activities like gardening, cooking, or tidying up, it is difficult to say where the scope of the idiom's meaning stops, and no more extension is possible. Hence, the meaning may be considered quite vague, both in the system and text. Due to its blurred scope, this feature has its advantages, too such as being intentionally vague, imprecise, and evasive, offering rich food to pragmatics. The idea of different uh, numbers of transformational possibilities for different types of idioms has been raised, I think, first by Fraser decades ago. What he did not elaborate on is that scale of anomalies uh, that is morphological and syntactical restrictions that any idiom takes uh, which is rather great and variable. If covered extensively in a description, it may be used actually for a functional classification of that particular class of idioms, which do behave functionally in the same way. That is, they have the same type of anomalies and restrictions. Thus, uh, an example five, Pull someone's leg, uh, which seems prototypically not to be used in questions, negative, passive voice, conditional mood, imperative, negative imperative, future tense, and first person singular and plural. Hence, it is highly defective and anomalous. On the other hand, uh, number six, have one's hands tied seems to be anomalous in that it does not use any question and passive voice being therefore perhaps less idiomatic. Should we base our perception of idiomaticity on the number of such anomalies? Now, such uh, groupings uh, of idioms having the same function as in five and six or any other combination of these anomalies will give us both iso-functional classes and an insight into how various types really do function in text. As this is based on objective, and verifiable data, this seems to be, in contrast to all of these semantic classifications, a very safe and objective classification. However, this has not been really done very much, that is with the exception of Czech, which you can see in the dictionary uh, shown uh, two floors above. 
A major part of textual functions overlapping with the transformational deficiencies above are various pragmatic functions that are best viewed in sentence type or propositional uh, idioms. Uh, a prominent feature of most idioms is the intrinsic evaluative function, often of a negative nature. Out of the four selected following synonyms uh, for die in English, kick the bucket, pass away, snuff it, cash one's chips, only one is euphemistic, hence positive, pass away, while the remaining three carry a basically negative evaluation related to a number of semantic and stylistic features, which I will not go into here. Now let's move on to general linguistic principles lying behind idioms. As we have seen above, describing a particular narrow uh, theory may be a problem. Subscribing to such a theory is a problem. Theories having their dark side in that they change and almost never correspond to full data. An example of Chomsky and linguistics having gone through so many different versions should serve as a sufficient deterrent. What about whittling the theoretical background to the very basics, making the approach almost atheoretical? To very primitive and hardly ever contested linguistic basics that should be taken into account are Saussurean notion of paradigm and syntagma and some ensuing consequences. Another linguistic primitive shared by all is the difference between what is regular and irregular in language, both in its system and text, that is long and parole. Any regularity falls back to the old Greek distinction of analogy based on repetition, as we know, while anomaly, where no repetition is expected, uh, is a famil in familiar uh, contrast to it. It has to be recalled, uh, it has been recalled in passing before. In a sense, all of the language is divided uh, in all of its categories and types into these two halves, uh, belonging thus either to what is regular and to what is anomalous, irregular. Any semantic and grammar rules lead normally to products that are regular, while the rest, where no rules are applicable, are irregular. And these include basically idioms and phrasemes, anomalous in very many senses. Hence, this distinction may be raised and viewed in a general way, displaying thus respective parts of the language that may uh, or might be called regular and irregular or an anomalous language. Now, while Ferdinand Saussure says that no single item in language uh, is isolated, uh, it's not in the canonical edition, uh, unfortunately, uh, which may be interpreted in a paradigmatic point of view. A complementary general law may be suggested, stressing the fact that any language item is predetermined to combine, to combine with other, which we might call a combinatory law. That is, it must enter combinations. Language combinations are viewed as widely different, though it has become customary to view them. In the case of lexicon as collocations only, which is just a very narrow point of view. Uh, the scale of combinatorial capacity, which is governed by semantics in the first place, and only subsequently modified by grammar, uh, is always limited, uh, going down to fewer and fewer combinations, ending with combinations, with a single other item. However, uh, there is always a combination available based on at least a single other item. Such words, because of this severe commentorial restriction, uh, may be called monocolocable words. Some examples have been offered above. Out of over 33,000 combinations of hand in British national corpus, only some do enter idioms as components, such as have one's hands tied up. To move further down the frequency scale, uh, we encounter such rather rare cases, uh, such as in accordance with, 
which always happens to be an idiom where accordance is limited, as we have seen linked to be two words only. And it's, in a way, its sole way of existence in language, actually. However, monocolloquial words may be viewed somewhat less strictly limited not only to one combination, single companion in combination, but also to a few. And by my uh, experience, it can go up to seven items. So, uh, for example, abeyance uh, is found in corpora in, and dictionaries in combination with fall in abeyance, hold, be in abeyance, go, and keep in abeyance, that is four words. Allay, allay fear, concern, suspicion, and pain, nostalgia, and criticism, but not more. To give some more examples from the alphabetical beginnings of a dictionary supported actually by data from BNC, the following lexemes undoubtedly belong to the category of monocolloquial words with varying, though always, a very small number of collocates. And uh, I will not go through all of the list, uh, which include words such as abeyance, abjure, ablaze, abort, abreast, absently, absolution, and so on. For general, regular language, such combinations with this kind of severe combinatorial restrictions are largely unusual. Many cases based on combinatorial anomaly are actually candidates of idioms. To frame and broaden uh, the picture with normal words, uh, seemingly not so restricted in their combinations, let us look at the combinatorial profile of a common word dog. To organize BNC data uh, somewhat uh, semantically, the chaotic array of words obtained uh, settles into rather well-defined classes by uh, meaning such as dog and its sounds, bark, whine, howl, movements, cringe, go, uh, lie, and other activities, qualities, body parts, food types, and uh, appurtenances. All of these, um, that is eight combinatorial or rather collocational classes, which we do really may call collocational paradigms, form together a collocational profile unique uh, for dog only. Since, for example, we know that cats do not wag their tails, neither do they bark, and so on. If complemented, they become, as a whole, the sole basis from where all our knowledge of what the dog actually means comes. Let us also notice and stress that in most cases, these classes may easily be enlarged and supplemented by more members that semantically belong to these classes. This is just uh, indicated by the dots following uh, each line. Now, up to now, uh, and as a useful background, this has only been an exercise in the Saussure's views. Uh, but what about hot dog and dog's dinner? That is a poor job mess which do not belong to any of these eight classes and which are moreover one member closed cl classes by themselves, allowing no enlargement or addition to them. Of course, these exhibit a severe combinatorial limitation again, a case of anomaly resulting in two special idioms. The distinction between uh, the eight classes above, that is closed classes, and the rest, that is open classes or paradigms, a distinction which was first originally put by Louis Jelmslev years ago is vital. Monocolloquial words where, from where many idioms are recruited belong L ipso to closed paradigms. However, while collocational paradigms are nowhere to be found, we do know that the word dog itself belongs uh, to a paradigm or two, namely to a class of mammals, uh, where wolf, cat, and elephant is found too, and perhaps loosely to that of domestic pets, cat, parent, guinea pig, and so on. In contradistinction to the previous type of collocational paradigm belonging to la parole, uh, language uh, use uh, uh, these uh, uh, words and classes uh, uh, and store them in one's memory, and we can call them because they can be recalled, from the memory uh, virtual paradigms because they are part of the language system. This type based on 
of paradigm on hyponymy, hyperanemy relation is more familiar to you. It is the one which is to be found in encyclopedias, school book, textbooks, and so on. Every word in language belongs to one or more virtual paradigms. Uh, let us recall the Saussure's dictum above. None remains hanging uh, isolated. Anomaly thus is uh, to be seen in uh, syntagmatically any formal uh, combination lacking an underlying rule behind its structure, while paradigmatically it refers to any membership of a formal item in a closed and very small paradigm. Anomaly is omnipresent in phraseology in different degrees and shades. It is its constitutive feature. Uh, the other major type, one that may be called functional anomaly, refers to irregular behavior, and I've already been uh, referring to it a bit. This brings us finally to the idiom's definition. Obviously, the phrase and idiom cannot be defined by a single property, whether formal, semantic, or other. The current and perhaps most widespread conception of the phrase is viewed as fixed and reproducible combination of elements, especially words whose meaning is partly or completely not deducible from the meaning of the components. Uh, now, skipping this a bit because it's a little bit more complicated, uh, I must just say that it can be made even more general, rephrasing the view of idioms into its final and very abstract form. Phrasing an idiom is such a non-model and fixed syntagma of elements of which at least one with respect to the other is a member of a extremely closed, extremely limited, both formally and mostly semantically closed paradigm. Let us illustrate these views on some examples. In accordance with, has been, has been already mentioned, uh, lie fellow, for example, another example where the number of uh, combinations of fellow is limited to lie fellow uh, only is another idiom and, uh, for example, fall in abeyance, uh, where the collocational paradigm is limited to hold in, be in, go in, and keep in. Now, a couple of notes uh, must be added explaining what has been mentioned above and has not been squeezed into these definitions. Uh, there is uh, a point related to the non-model uh, syntagma in the definition. Uh, the idea of uh, model formation of idioms is absurd. It has been voiced very often in the past, as it has never been shown that one can actually ad hoc decide to form a new idiom, maybe on a Monday afternoon, by oneself. It seems to be a patent nonsense of myself being able to form a new idiom, even more so than an unlimited word formation where restrictions are also misleadingly non-existent. It is obvious, then, that a primary and simple identification test based on commutation is implied. A such test of idioms can consist of three steps, at least. First, verification of stableness and verification of metaphoric character, and finally, commutation test. Uh, that is, uh, finding out whether the component doesn't allow uh, for its substitution by another one, which is the core of the, of the definition. Steps, two, uh, steps one and three are vital, not number two. Now, this test specifically discriminates grammar idioms where no metaphors obtain. Hence, in the array of seemingly many possibilities to form multi-word expressions, or specifically prepositions of a certain kind, based on a combination of as and a preposition, and I'm repeating myself in an extended way, we can just look at uh, possibilities as about, as above, as after, as behind, as by, as below, as down, as for, as in, and so on, finding that only two prepositional idiomatic combinations do exist, that is as for and as to in English, the rest not existing at all or not being a fixed combination. Now, very briefly, some conclusions. Trying to concentrate on major issues of idioms, these notes had to be both brief and complete, of course. While many points have been touched upon only briefly or implicitly, such as meta-language and so on. 
It is to be stressed yet again that views expressed here are supported by the application to full data in a very large dictionary of phraseology of Czech. Uh, that is, which is based on these principles and applied in practice, both in choice of data and specifying individual anomalies. Obviously, most data here and in the dictionary are based on corpus findings. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Frantisek, for this most interesting theoretical talk. Uh, we have a couple of minutes of a couple of short questions. Yes, please. Colin. Uh, you have, as, as started as, in, as not a, a phrasal unit. Um, it, it is a phrasal unit when followed by a very specific time. So you'd say the share market as at 4 o'clock this afternoon but you can't say the share market as at 1956. That's too general. The, the time has to be a month or a day or closer to that. So that particular as at is a phrasal expression with a slot in it, and the slot has to be a specific time. Uh, thank you. Actually, I was not very much interested in the impossibility, complete impossibility, but the unusuality. So, because my major concern was trying to find out idioms, that is, those combinations which are stable. Um, there are only two which I've just shown. 